Today we're going to talk about banks, banking. Uh, before I start, I want just to remind you that uh, we have Hank Greenberg coming on uh, Wednesday. And we talked about him in a previous lecture, but he is one of the most important capitalists, <laughs> I think, in the uh, world. Uh, the firm AIG, which was started by C.V. Starr, was converted into the biggest insurance company in the world by uh, Hank Greenberg. Over many years, the two of them ran AIG exclusively, first Starr and then Greenberg. Uh, and uh, Greenberg produced a, uh, a, a very innovative insurance giant. Uh, it didn't end well, <laughs> but I think he. T I talked to him the other day. He said he's going to talk about the end, what what uh, what he learned from the experience. Uh, once again, no one can control everything that happens, and uh, random shocks affect all of our lives. Uh, he remains a very important. He's no longer at AIG. Remains a very important force in our society. Now he's. Uh, very much involved with philanthropy and uh, doing things like lecturing <laughs> young people, uh, which he freely does uh, out of a sense of commitment. So I think he's a committed person that has a moral purpose. That's uh, why I brought, asked him to be one of our lecturers. So, uh, but today we're talking about banks. And I wanted to, uh, the outline of my lecture, I'm going to start with uh, the origins of banks thousands of years ago. Uh, then I'll talk about the theory <coughs> of banks, uh, fractional reserves and deposit insurance, then uh, bank regulation, particularly in light of the world financial crisis, which has changed the nature of regulation, changes that will be with us for decades to come. Uh, I'll talk about shadow banking, which is the new banking sector that emerged and uh, escaped regulation until the crisis. And then I'll talk at the end a little bit about comparison of, uh, fi of financial crises in the past in various places around the world uh, to see how banks uh, managed in those crises. So. Uh, First thing I want to say, this is a lecture about banks, okay? And that means traditional banks who uh, take deposits and lend money. Uh, it's not about investment banks. That's another lecture. An investment bank, does, uh, a pure investment bank, does not accept deposits. And its most characteristic thing is underwriting of securities. So that's a different lecture. And I'm not talking about central banks in this lecture. That's also well, the lecture on monetary policy. Central banks are the government organizations that manage the money supply of, e of a country. OK. So uh, we're talking here about banks. And uh, I thought I should start out by defining a bank. Uh, the word bank, by the way, means counter or tabletop, where bankers used to do their business. Uh, that's the English word that emerged in the uh, 15th century. Uh, but the banks, of course, precede that with other names. Uh, what is it that is the characteristic activity of banks? Um, I would say the most, maybe the most characteristic thing is that banks earn spread income. That is, they borrow at a lower interest rate and lend it out at a higher interest rate, and they make the difference. Your deposit rate is lower than the rate at which they charge for the loans they make. So that's the spread income or margin. So that might be considered the core idea of a bank, that uh, you, you borrow at a lower rate than you lend. 
but I'm not sure that that summarizes it either. There's other aspects of banks that we'll, we'll talk about. Um, another um, aspect of banks traditionally has been note issue. That is, they print paper money uh, and then it circulates and goes. Y you, you have some of these in your pocket. <laughs> they're, they're, they're currency. Uh, if you stopped a person on the street a couple hundred years ago and said, What is the essence of a bank? I suspect the first thing they would say is, Oh, they print money, and that's the paper money that we use. But you don't think of it this way. That's probably not, <laughs> because most of that function all over the world has been shifted to the government banks, the central banks in, in the various countries. And so uh, you don't think of private banks as issuing banknotes. But they used to, and it used to be prominent. Uh, the private bank issuing of notes today in the world. I believe is concentrated primarily in two countries. One of them is the United Kingdom, and the other one is Hong Kong. Uh, tell me if there's another country. I, I don't know who else does it. In the United Kingdom, there are eight banks that still print pound sterling notes, uh, and not, they're not very prominent. In Scotland, uh, there, there are some. Uh, I actually once went through the channel from England to Scotland, uh, from Scotland to France, and I tried to spend my Scottish sterling notes on the train, and the guy who was French speaking stared at it and said, What's this? And he wouldn't take it. So I said, This is pound sterling. This is official. This is <laughs> um, trades at par <laughs> with the Bank of England notes. Uh, Hong Kong has uh, uh, three banks that issue their banknotes. Um, the Royal, let's see, Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank Corporation, the Standard Charter Bank, and the Bank of China, Hong Kong. Everywhere else, banks don't issue notes. And the reason they don't is laws have been made to prevent them, because these notes lost value so many times in financial crises. That government said it's not something that will allow private banks to do. So uh, it's generally gone. If you look at your $1 bills in your pocket, it will give the name of a Federal Reserve Bank, and there's 12 of them. Uh, our Federal Reserve Bank here is the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. So you can look at your dollar bills and see which bank issued it. Uh, so you're probably carrying a lot of Boston money, but since it's all the government, you know, you don't even notice that, right? You don't notice if this were 1750 and you had Boston money in your pocket, you might, because we're in Connecticut, you might have a problem. You'd have to go to a money dealer and have it exchanged because they didn't know or trust the Boston bank. That's all past. So, note issue is a matter of history. Uh, so, um, there's other aspects of a bank I want to emphasize. One is, Liquidity. And this is an essential element of banking as well. And I'll come back to that when we talk about theory in a minute. But banks offer liquidity by <coughs> borrowing short and lending long. This is different from spread income. I'm saying the interest rate is lower on the borrowing of the bank than the lending of the bank. There's another discrepancy. The maturity is longer on the lending of the bank than the borrowing of the bank. So banks are providers of liquidity. That means a business wants to borrow money, or let's say a homeowner wants to borrow money to buy a home. Right? There, let's take that example, because that's more familiar. You're going to lock up the money for th maybe 30 years. You don't, you don't want to pay the loan back tomorrow. What if the lender says, I need the money, give it back? You can't give it back, or you don't want to give it back. So what a bank does is it takes deposits and allows people to cash them in whenever they want. It lends the money out long on 30-year or so loans. 
So it generates liquidity. The borrower has what he or she wants, which is a 30-year loan. The lender has what they want. They have, uh, they have a, um, a loan, um, an account they can get at any time. But the problem with it, and so this is an important function of banks, but the problem with it is that there's a problem of crises. Because if everybody asks to pull their money out at once, they can't do it. The banks, in normal circumstances, generate liquidity, but they create a system that's vulnerable. And so the banking industry uh, has been uh, plagued by frequent crises throughout history. So um, I wanted to say something about the very beginnings of banking. Who did it first? Well, the, by the way, I should have written the word interest rate. When I'm talking about spread income or margin, I'm talking about the difference between two interest rates. But more primitive is the idea of interest rate. Uh, so where did that idea come from? Well, I was reading some um, histori economic historians. Apparently, the word interest first appeared in the uh, Sumerian language. Uh, I guess the oldest records are about 2000 BC. Uh, and they had a word which they write as M A S, I guess that's pronounced mash, uh, which was their word for interest. But it also means lamb. And so uh, one historian was wondering why do the Sumerians use the same word for interest as they do for an animal, a lamb? And he thought that maybe it was because uh, the idea of lending money at interest grew out of an earlier idea of renting land. So you would have land that you weren't using in ancient Sumeria, and you would rent it out to somebody who would then <coughs> use it. And one of the things that the person would do with it is graze livestock, graze sheep on the land. So you would say, well, I need some produce from the land to compensate me for letting you use it. So the guy would say, fine, I'll give you all the offspring of our sheep, the lambs. That was an old tradition in Sumeria. So they thought it's basically the same thing. It's like giving over the lambs. If I lend you money, I'm giving you productive resources, and it's going to produce something. We'll call it lambs, and I want that in compensating me for it. So that's where the idea began. Uh, and so uh, you'll find it in the ancient world, in the, uh, the near uh, non-Oriental ancient world, in ancient Greece and Rome. Interest was well established, and some kind of banking. Now, I, I don't know whether there were bankers in Sumeria, but there probably were, because all it takes is that you do both sides. You know, if you're lending money, actually they didn't necessarily lend money in those days. They would lend barley or wheat, and they would and charge interest in terms of wheat. Uh, you, didn't need, you don't need money to do banking. Uh, but uh, I, I suspect that somebody in ancient Sumeria was doing both sides. He was borrowing wheat and lending it and earning a spread income. And so there, was bank, there must have been banking in, in uh, ancient world. So, but anyway, uh, what about these kinds of institutions that we call banks? Oh, also. The first, apparently, if I've got my history right, the uh, first uh, record of interest rates in China was Song Dynasty. Uh, and, and that was um, from the year 960 to 1279. Uh, they were, at that point, inventing paper money and other financial institutions. Um, I don't know if they had institutions called banks, but. Uh, you know, it often would be a, a family business, lending money. Uh, if you were a prominent family, you would often take other people's uh, uh, money for safe, safekeeping. And uh, it was also connected with uh, religious temples in the past. But the modern banks seem to appear um, in Italy in Renaissance times. Uh, where they actually had a banking institution. And that's where the oldest bank in the world today 
uh, exists. It's uh, uh, Banca Monte uh, de Dei Pashi uh, in Siena. And that means the bank of the mountain of sheep. The same, <laughs> it's the same analogy, I guess. Um, I don't think they called their inches lambs, but. Uh, and so that bank was set up in uh, 1472. Uh, that, that's the oldest surviving bank in the world. I went there. You can go there if you visit Siena, and they have a little museum on the uh, first floor near the lobby. And uh, it's actually the third largest bank in Italy. Uh, very old institution. Uh, it's interesting that the, this bank, which was founded in 1472, was founded as a philanthropic institution to lend money to the poor. And wealthy donors in Italy gave money to set up this bank. It goes beyond that now. It's not just lending to the poor. Uh, the other thing uh, is in the 1600s, they gave it deposit insurance. Believe it or not, uh, the, the Duke of Siena uh, said he would guarantee all deposits. So, uh, deposit insurance appears to have been invented in Italy as well. Uh, but a lot of people emphasize, when they talk about the history of, of banking, I was reading, uh, in pr preparing for this, uh, histories of economic histories to see what they would say about banking. And uh, Professor Clive Day, a professor here at Yale, wrote a book called Theory, oh, uh, History of Commerce in 1907. Uh, you can pick up his book if you want to on Google Books. It's past its copyright. And I had great fun reading it. Uh, he's long gone, professor at Yale. Um, but his history begins in England with the so-called Goldsmith Bankers. What happened was, in England, in the six, uh, maybe 1500s or 1600s, somewhere around that, goldsmiths who made gold jewelry had safes where they were good places to store gold. And so people would go to the goldsmith, uh, and maybe they were having jewelry made, but then they'd say, could you keep some of my gold in your vault? And so the goldsmith banker would say, all right, I'll do that. And I'll give you a note saying, I'll, I'll promise to pay you this amount of gold that's in my vault. So sometime when you're out shopping, the goldsmith banker's note would be in your pocket still. And you'd, you'd want to buy something. So you'd say, well, I've got this gold. You talk to the merchant, and you say, I've got this gold that's in the goldsmith. I've got his note here. So the, uh, the merchant would say, all right, I'll take that, but you've got to endorse it over to me. Write a note on the note saying that uh, this thing is being transferred to me. And so I can go to the goldsmith and get it out. And that's how paper money got started in England. Uh, it started to circulate with many endorsements on it. And then finally the goldsmith said, well, let's forget about endorsing it to one person. Let's just say to the bearer. And so the paper money started developing kind of spontaneously. And then the goldsmiths noticed, you know, they've got all this gold in their vault. They can lend it out. Why not? Because nobody ever comes and asks for it. Now that these paper notes are circulating, nobody asks for it. So I'll start lending it out. And they didn't have to pay any interest on the notes because people would hold them anyway just because they valued the safekeeping. I guess they were paying interest in the sense that they were providing the safekeeping. So that's how uh, banking got started in England, but it was really preceded in Italy. So uh, uh, okay. Uh, so let me. Th what, what has happened is uh, uh, because of repeated problems in the banking industry, which gradually grew through time into something that's more and more important. Governments all over the world regulate them, and that means they define certain specific types of banks that uh, uh, differ a little bit from one country to another. Uh, and you have to, when you decide to create a, a bank, you have to uh, decide which type you are. Uh, so I wanted to start, and 
your textbook, Favosi, talks a lot about types of banks. Um, but uh, let me just talk about the, the major types. In the, I'll talk in the U.S. The most important type of bank is called a commercial bank. Uh, and these are banks that take deposits. You can put your money in the bank, and then it will pay you interest. Uh, and it will also make loans of various kinds, uh, but most characteristically, business loans. Uh, commercial banks were the most, even more prominent 100 or 200 years ago, because they didn't do mortgages and consumer loans. There. It was all business loans uh, initially. So this is kind of the historic, important kind of uh, bank. And in 2010, uh, the total assets uh, of U.S. commercial bank uh, of U.S. located commercial banks was 14.6 trillion, but actually, a lot of that was foreign commercial banks operating in the United States. Of that 14.6 trillion, uh, only 10.1 was U.S. chartered banks. So bankers operate all over the world. And so we have banks like H, uh, I mentioned Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank Corporation, or the various Swiss banks that have big operations, or Deutsche Bank, big operations in the United States. So they account for almost a third of our commercial banks. Uh, but then there are other kinds of banks, and they're smaller in terms of, this is assets of the banks. It's not their market cap. M market cap would be much lower, because remember, offsetting these assets are liabilities they owe to the depositors. Uh, so, uh, but there's other kinds of banks. There are savings banks, and uh, uh, in the in the you know, in the U.S., they uh, savings banks. Um, had only 1.2 trillion. Uh, these uh, savings banks were generally, they tend to be old institutions that have grown very large over time. They're the result of a savings bank movement in the 19th century, which was a philanthropic movement to set up banks for uh, lower income people. Because commercial banks traditionally wouldn't take deposits from small, uh, you'd have to have a minimum size. They didn't care about, they didn't deal with ordinary people. So they created savings banks to encourage uh, thrift and saving. Actually, it follows on a UK movement, savings bank movement in the UK. And they're still with us, but they're not, as, uh, not so big. And there's also credit unions. That's another social movement. And they're only uh, 0.9 trillion, or about 900 billion in assets. Credit unions are basically clubs of people that belong together in some group. Uh, so you can, if you have a company, you can set up a credit union for the employees of your company. Uh, they're, they make both savings banks and credit unions make a lot of mortgage loans. That's kind of their characteristic. Uh, characteristic business. Uh, in the uh, UK, you have the same kinds of banks. The, the, uh, savings, uh, the savings banks would be called building societies, but it's the same idea. So they make loans for buildings. Um, okay. So I, I said I would talk about the, oh, about the uh, uh, theory of banks. I've already given you some indication by describing what is it that banks do. But uh, I see I have a lot more to talk about than I have to s <laughs> consider my time here. There's so much to say about banks. It's a whole fascinating subject. But I wanted to mention uh, the theory of banks was uh, uh, laid out in the diamond Dibvig model. Uh, in the Journal of Political Economy, 1988. They were both colleagues of ours at Yale. They've moved on. Uh, so I know them both, uh, Doug Diamond and Phil Dibley. 
But what they described is a model, I'm not going to give you the model, just to tell you about it, a theoretical model of banks as providers of liquidity. Uh, that uh, liquidity is an economic good that you can somehow get for nothing. It comes out of, well, it's just like portfolio diversification. It, uh, we don't need to expend any resources to get diversification. We just have to manage our portfolios right. Similarly, you set up a bank, and lo and behold, liquidity appears. And it makes it possible for people to live their lives better. I mentioned you, know, you can live in a house for 30 years, or you can move whenever you want. Uh, but the problem with, th with this is that there are multiple equilibria. Their model has a good equilibrium and a bad equilibrium. And it depends on expectations. If people think that the uh, banking system is sound and is going to work well, it works splendidly. But the problem is, all it takes is for people to suddenly change their expectations. And then it falls apart because you have a run, you have a bank run. So what Diamond and Dibvig did is to provide an economic rationale for deposit insurance. It's a system depo insuring deposits against the uh, default of the bank helps people, helps prevent bad outcomes, keeps us in the right equilibrium. So this is an uh, important uh, uh, paper. The problem is that bank runs are can be triggered it, 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 by random shocks to the model. And so uh, what happened in the latest crisis is there was a, a real estate bubble. It's not something that's represented in Diamond and Divvig. Uh, and the bubble, when it burst, when home prices started falling and commercial real estate prices started falling, the, the banking system started to fall apart. Uh, so it's not entirely easy to keep uh, uh, banks uh, under good uh, control. Now I wanted to talk about other aspects of banks besides, you see, Diamond and Divvig emphasize that banks are an invention that creates liquidity. And liquidity is a positive economic good that makes us run our lives better. And so it's an important invention in the history of economics. But there's other issues that banks do, problems they solve. One of them is an adverse selection problem. That plagues securities. I, I didn't mention the alternative to banks for raising money if you're a business are, uh, is that you could issue bonds or commercial paper. You can borrow money directly from the public without an intermediary. Okay, I'm a company. They do this. Uh, I'm a company. I need money to say build a new factory. I go not to a commercial bank, I go to an investment bank, and they help me issue some paper to the public. Uh, and we sell it off in some market. The problem with, with, uh, with issuing debt directly to the public is that the public can't judge the quality of the company easily. Right? The, most people are not, who are investors are not good at estimating the value of the security of a company. So they need some kind of experts. If the adverse selection would happen, see the experts, the people who know, would buy all the good stuff. And it would leave beyond. Uh, people would start to think, I'm not going to buy these securities because why are they being offered to me? I don't know anything. I'm a sucker. <laughs> That's the idea. I'm not a sucker. I just don't know. I may be smart, but I just don't know what the quality of this company is. So I'm, if I just go in there blindly and pick up whatever seems to be out there, I'm going to suffer an adverse selection. I'm going to get the worst stuff because I'm not looking. I can't look. They're going to dump the bad paper on me. So banks solve that by being in the community, knowing who is borrowing, and, and having a reputation. So that instead of you suffering this adverse selection problem, the bank has people who know what's going on. So the thing about banks is they have local loan officers who serve in a particular community. 
and they know all about that community, and they solve the adverse selection problem. Um, the adverse, so, so for example, if you are a loan officer in a bank, by tradition, you are someone who uh, gets involved in the community. You'll find them on the, uh, on the program at the symp symphony, they're among the donors. They show up for all kinds of things. They know what's going on. They play golf with local business people. They hear the gossip. So someone says, you know, this guy, CEO of this company, I think he's an alcoholic. You better watch this guy. I don't know what he's doing. You hear these things. You know what happens? The guy doesn't get a loan the next day. Uh, I hate to say it, but it's, it's, it, it, they kind of vouch for the character of people. I, I mentioned this in a previous lecture, that there's all kinds of people out there, and you can't prove or judge who's good. You can't write it down in some objective way. Who's going to be a, a responsible business person? But banks know that, so they solve the adverse selection problem. Uh, there's also a um, moral hazard problem that banks solve. Uh, the moral hazard is that a company uh, may borrow money and then take a big flyer and do some wild investment. Let's, let's think this, for example. Suppose we own a small company and it's not doing well. We have this great idea. Let's borrow you know, $10 million and let's go to the racetrack and let's put it all on the uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, least likely horse to win, all right? And, he, you know, our chance of winning is only one, or ten, one of ten, but if we win, I got a hundred million dollars, okay? If we lose, then, hey, we just go bankrupt. We say, sorry. Uh, of course, you really couldn't do it at the racetrack. I mean, you'd be sued if you did that. But you see what I'm saying? I, would, I, I could see, I wouldn't do that, but I could see wanting to do that, right? Your company is going out of business anyway. You know, you don't have any prospects. But we, if we can borrow $10 million, go and bet it on the racetrack, and one in 10 will be super rich. We'll have 90 million, right? Pay off the debtors, everything's fine. They won't complain if you win. <laughs> They'll complain if you lose, but then you say, sorry, you know, we're out of business. So it's limited liability. So what banks do is they help solve this problem by constant monitoring, and they make commercial loans they're effectively long-term, but in practice, in officially short-term. They keep renewing them, and they can cut you off when they think you're doing something that reflects moral hazard. So the constant monitoring that banks provide solves the moral hazard problem, uh, just as their information collection solves the adverse selection problem. So, um, okay. Uh, I'm just trying to see where I want to go next. Um, so I, I, I mentioned deposit insurance. Uh, I mentioned that it started in Italy in the 1600s, uh, but it, it has a long history of uh, governments backing up deposits of banks in order to prevent bank runs, because bank runs happen too often. People would get a little scare, and they would go to the bank and try to pull all their money out. They'd hear a rumor, and then the whole banking system could collapse. So people in various governments at various times offered guarantees. But the problem is, those guarantees can get really expensive. So sometimes they had a limited guarantee, and so sometimes the deposit insurance scheme would fail. Uh, and so, the history of deposit insurance is a checkered one. Uh, so, in the United States, there were various state governments, local governments, that created deposit insurance schemes before the FDIC, but a lot of them failed. And so, people said, this is a crazy idea. But uh, the United States government in uh, 19, I think it was 33, do I have this right, um, created I'll put it, I think that's right. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation as part of the New Deal under uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And it has never failed to this date. Uh, why didn't it fail? I think because it's hard to know exactly. We never had a big bank run in, since 1933. It seemed to create the psychology that people stopped worrying about 
bank failures because they thought they believed they were insured. I guess they believed Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, and uh, so, uh, if you believe it, then th th it, it's one of those funny things. That it's the multiple equilibrium that Diamond Dibvik mentioned. As long as people believe the bank system is sound, it is sound. Uh, but we did have a. Uh, we also created later another deposit insurance called the Federal Saving and Loan Insurance Corporation that was doing the saving and loan associations, which were a, a type of saving bank. Uh, and that did fail. Uh, and so we had a huge crisis in the United States called the Saving and Loan Crisis in the 1980s. Um, so if the SNL crisis in the 1980s uh, was um, due to a widespread failure of saving and loan associations, and then kind of a run on the saving and loan, but it, it wasn't really a run because the FSLIC was trusted, and what ended up happening is the F FSLIC had reserves against a certain amount of losses from the banks, but they went through them completely, and then they were bankrupt. So the insurer went bankrupt. What then happened is the United States government picked up the tab, uh, and the total tab was 150 billion. So we, uh, and that restored confidence. I guess the government had to do that. So what you really uh, and, and the FSLIC no longer exists. Savings and loans are now insured by the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. So, what, you know, these institutions really don't necessarily represent the real insurance. When you have to always see beyond institutions, the FSLIC was uh, encouraging people to believe in the security of the banking system. But it really wasn't the ultimate security. The ultimate security wasn't even written down. It was, it was the recognition by the U.S. government that if we let FSLIC fail and we let all these depositors in the savings and loans lose their money, it's going to destroy the confidence that has kept us away from bank runs. And the next thing, the commercial banks, or uh, who knows uh, what else will happen. So what always happens is the government stands behind these promises, even if they weren't made so clearly. Uh, there's another example. Uh, uh, I'll give you, which is more recent, of a, of a bank run. And that occurred in the United Kingdom in 2007. The bank was called Northern Rock. Uh, and uh, a rumor started, this was at the beginning of the financial crisis, the rumor started that Northern Rock held a lot of subprime securities and was going to go bankrupt. So people rushed to Northern Rock, and big lines formed outside of Northern Rock uh, of people. They wanted to get there first, because you thought, well, they're, just, they're still handing out the money. I want to be there first. And then newspaper photographers photographed the crowd outside the bank, and people thought, well, this is just like 1933 in the huge banking crises. Uh, and so, uh, now actually, um, the, uh, the, U the UK government did have deposit insurance, but uh, the deposit insurance in the UK would insure fully all deposits up to 3,000 uh, pounds. And then it gave 90% insurance up to 75,000 uh, pounds. After that, you were out of luck, okay? So why was there a bank run on Northern Rock when there was deposit insurance? Well, I'll tell you, it was people who had more than 3,000 pounds in the bank. It's <laughs> very simple. Uh, and so, th th you know, they didn't really have uh, enough deposit insurance to stop a run. So Mervyn King, who's uh, head of the Bank of England, just decided, you know what? We'll bail everybody out, no questions. Forget our deposit insurance scheme, uh, and that stopped the run. So again, it happened the same way in the United Kingdom. The, uh, the deposit insurance stopped it before there was any problem. 
So the United Kingdom has never had a bank run failure since 1866. And that's because it's, it's not really because of any deposit insurance scheme. It's, a, it's about the Bank of England, which is their central bank, and what it does to maintain confidence. Other countries handle it differently. I was going to mention uh, in Germany, IKB uh, Deutsche Industriebank. Okay, uh, in um, 2007, uh, this is a German bank that German depositors put their money in, and uh, it had invested a lot in subprime securities, and it was in trouble, and there was starting to be worries of a, a run on them. The German government didn't even wait <laughs> for, a, for a bank run. They just bailed them out, uh, and it cost them um, one point. Uh, 1.5 billion euros. But again, it's the, the governments know that they want to maintain confidence, and so they do it. They do what they have to do. Now I want to go to uh, bank regulation more generally. If you are insuring banks, then you better regulate them because there's a moral hazard problem. I just described a moral hazard problem for a, a company that borrows money from a bank. But there's moral hazard problems for banks as well. Namely, banks can do the same trick. I said, go to the racetrack. <laughs> Borrow money and go to the racetrack. Banks can do that. Same thing. I said, they wouldn't actually go to the racetrack. They would pick some really risky business venture. Uh, and if it fails, then it all falls to the deposit insurer. Whenever you, this is a fundamental lesson of insurance. Whenever you insure something, you've got to regulate the person insured. Because once you've taken a risk from their shoulders, you create moral hazard for them. Uh, and so bank regulation is very important. So I was going to talk mostly here about the kind of bank regulation that has an international dimension. Uh, and so what I wanted to talk about is the Basel uh, bank regulations that uh, were generated by a international organization in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, after the saving and loan crisis, was, uh, the first ba Basel one was, a, uh, was an international meeting that published a set of recommendations for all the countries of the world to regulate their banks. The idea was that there should be some coherence across countries. If one country regulates its bank very stiffly, that's going to drive business out of that country into other countries. Also, there should be some standardization. It helps the world economy if everybody knows that all the banks of the world have similar regulations. But Basel, the Basel Committee, as it's called, that created the recommendations, had no legal authority. All it could do is recommend. But it did recommend bank uh, regulations, and these were widely adopted around the world. Uh, each country could make modifications, whatever they want. You know, there's no, you can't order countries around, <laughs> but uh, they often followed the Basel recommendations. Uh, in Basel II, they met again uh, in the uh, 2000s, and they issued recommendations in 2004. Uh, they, what they said in Basel, too, was the banking system was getting so much more complicated that they had to think more about how to do it. Now there's all these complicated derivatives and special purpose vehicles, uh, and so they had to update their uh, regulation. Unfortunately, Basel, too, has suffered a reputation blow because right after Basel, too, uh, we had the world financial crisis. So they didn't do something right. <laughs> they didn't really fix the system in Basel II. So that brought us to Basel III, uh, which is uh, the latest version. And they issued their report in 2010. Uh, and also in 2010, the G20 nations meeting in Seoul, Korea, uh, expressed their um, support for Basel III. 
So Basel III is the current world regulation standard, uh, and it, um, but it's phased in gradually, and it won't be fully phased in until 2019. Uh, they didn't want to put it in all at once because the world is in a financial crisis and it would be too stressful. So the, it has a slow, uh, slow phase in, and uh, it, some of the details haven't even been worked out yet. They've recommended the, the G20 countries have agreed in principle that these regulations are where we'll go, but it, uh, details have yet to be worked out. But I wanted to, I, you know, bank regulation is a big business. We could spend, a, we could have a whole semester on studying what these guys do. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a, a kind of a caricature of what's in Basel. It's also in Fabozzi, the Fabozzi textbook, which is copyright 2010. You'd think this would be in it, but it's not. Basel I and Basel II are in Fabozzi. Basel III isn't because it didn't come in until the end of 2010, and so the book was, uh, didn't, it didn't make it in uh, time to appear in your book. Uh, but I wanted to just give you a, just a, a, uh, a simple account of all the Basel agreements uh, and some sense of where we are with Basel III. Uh, they're all about banks having enough money, you know, not uh, taking on too much, enough money for the risks they take. L let me start with Basel I, uh, and, uh, because part of Basel I is in force in all three of them. And uh, there's a concept called risk-weighted assets, which is in Basel I. And Basel II and Basel III, essentially the same. Okay, so now here's the idea. The, 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 uh, we're going to put capital requirements based on risk-weighted asset. And what, what does that mean? That means that banks uh, cannot take too many risks. They can't go beyond. They, they have to have enough money to back them up for the risks they take. And we'll call that money capital, okay? It's not money, it's not cash, but it's assets that they can use to get them out of trouble if the risky assets do badly. So if we're going to make, we're going to have a requirement on how much capital a bank holds, we have also to define their risks. And so Basel I had a very simple formula to compute risk-weighted assets. Well, it's very simple <laughs> until you get into all the details. Uh, and so uh, you, you'll see the definition of risk-weighted assets. It's in Table 3.3 three in uh, Fabozzi. Uh, but basically, here it is. There's four categories of assets. Uh, the 0% weight, the 20% rate, the weight, the 50% weight, and the 100% weight. The higher the weight, it means more risky, okay? So, uh, where will I write these? Um, I'll do it up here. Now, we're talking about all three, Basel 1, 2, and 3. Zero percent are uh, national, well, I'll say OECD government bonds, national government bonds. The OECD is the or or Organization for European Cooperation and Development, and they had represent advanced, stable European countries, and U.S. government bonds um, are included among them. Okay, what else? Uh, uh, it's basically this. Th th those were the, the um, yeah, th basically that's it. Now, there might be something else in there, and I'm sure there is, but this is the simple. Zero percent rate, because these have zero percent risk. There's no risk, okay? So banks can hold all they want of these, and they don't have to hold any capital. Then next up is 20 percent weight. And that's municipal bonds, now, uh, or local bonds. That's not issued by the national governments, but issued by a city or a state. We're having a municipal bond crisis now. They're suddenly showing their risk, and we're worried about defaults on them. So Basel I was right to give them some weight. 
They gave them a 20% weight because they thought municipal bonds are pretty safe. Uh, and they're not as safe as uh, national government bonds because there's examples of default. Um, but they also included, there's, some, there's a long list of what they include, but notably Fannie and Freddie. <laughs> were, these are the two mortgage lenders in the United States were included for a 20% weight. Because people thought these guys are really safe, and anyway, the U.S. government backs them up. Although the U.S. government said it wouldn't back them up, but you know, we, we all know they're going to back them up, and indeed, they did back them up when they failed. But uh, uh, Fannie and Freddie, prior to the crisis, started increasingly investing in subprime mortgages. And they were. Uh, issuing subprime mortgage securities that were really very risky and eventually went kaput. Basel I didn't know that, or Basel II and <laughs> Basel III still, they just give them a 20% weight. It was a big mistake. That, that's where the, partly the banking crisis comes. Then there's 50% weight, and that's for mortgages, home mortgages. The Basel people thought there could be some big real estate crisis so, you know, it's, it's something to worry about, so there's more weight than that. And then we have 100% on everything else, but notably loans, like uh, commercial lo loans to businesses. All right. Uh, uh, so those are the weights. Uh, and so I just wanted to go through a simple example. Suppose you are a bank, uh, and you have Four hundred million dollars in assets on your balance sheet. Okay, these are things that you, as a bank, own. And let's say you have one hundred in government bonds, federal government bonds, one hundred in Fannie Mae, one hundred million, and you have one hundred in mortgages that you own directly, and you have one hundred in commercial loans. So your total assets are 400 million, but you got to know what your risk-weighted assets are. So what are your risk-weighted assets? Well, I take the 100. Fabozzi goes through an example too, but this is very easy. Uh, I multiply the 100 by zero, I get zero. I multiply this 100 by 20 percent, so that gives me t uh, 20 million, right? I multiply the mortgages by 50 percent, it gives me 50 million. And I gotta uh, throw all these in. So what what does that add up to? It's 170 million. RWA <laughs> risk weighted assets, right? It's 20, zero plus 20 plus 50 plus 100. All right. So those are my risk weighted assets, and then the amount of capital that I have to hold is a percentage of the risk weighted assets. Uh, I, I don't want to go through. I could go through Basel one, Basel two, Basel three. They kept changing these percentages, and it's <laughs> as they went along. So I'm just going to talk about Basel three because that's going forward. All right. So uh, Basel and Basel three is complicated too. I'm going to uh, just talk to you about common equity requirements. So Basel three <coughs> says. And it's, it's an interesting and creative construct. Common equity must be 4.5% of RWA at all times. Uh, but I'll add to that. They have uh, plus. 2.5 percent, which they call a cap capital conservation buffer, and so that adds up to 7 percent. I'll explain. You absolutely have to have 4.5 percent as common equity, uh, but. If you don't also have another two and a half percent, you can't pay out any dividends. <laughs> That's not so good. 
So in reality, uh, you, you better keep 7%. So effectively, Basel III, this is Basel III. Not in your textbook, but uh, it's coming uh, all over the world. 7%, okay. Now, incidentally, the interesting thing about Basel III, they're, they're, they're thinking creatively. They added another buffer uh, called a countercyclical buffer. Well, that's not added automatically. Uh, and that's another 2.5%. But only if the regulators in the country choose to impose it. And, and here's the idea. We have to stop bubbles before they burst, right? So if, suppose you think that a bubble is building up in your country. Then the regulators are asked by Basel, if they make that judgment, to add another 2.5% to the capital requirement while it's booming. You do this while it's, you don't wait until the crisis to do this, because then they'll all be in trouble. And if you, if you tighten up on banks then, they'll stop making loans and they'll crash the whole economy. You've got to tighten up when times are good. So that adds up to 9.5%. Okay, so you'd have to hold capital equal to 9.5% of your risk-weighted asset. But presumably, the normal number is 7%. Okay, so let me just go through for this bank here, which has $400 million in assets. What is their requirement? Well, we figured out that they have $170 million in risk weighted assets. Multiply that by 7%, uh, and that gives you, I think it's $11.9 million that they have. Right, so you're. you're um, your common equity must be 11.9 million. So you go to your balance sheet. We showed balance sheets in an earlier. Uh, the common equity plus the buffer, right? That's the same buffer. I'm sorry. Uh, 11.9 Oh, did I do that with? Yeah, I'm sorry. That's 7% of 170 million. Uh, yeah, it does have. You, you don't actually have to do. You, yeah, you, you don't actually have to hold this buffer, but it limits you if you don't. And so, practically, most banks will. So, so then you go to look on your balance sheet and you see, hey, we're lucky. We've got 12.9 million. Let's say I just made that up. All right. How do you get common equity? You take the total assets in your balance sheet. You subtract off all of the liabilities, all the money you owed. And that gives you shareholders' equity, but that has two components, common equity and preferred equity. So you've got to subtract off the preferred equity. But it, it's a sense of how much extra resources you have. After you've paid off all your debts, you still have uh, $12.9 million. Uh, so that gives, that's, that's uh, you say, hey, we're, we're good. We've got an extra million dollars. Okay, so then you bring that up at the board meeting and say, we're satisfying Basel III. Isn't that great? But someone at the board might say, but wait a minute. That means we have a million dollars too much. It's just sitting there. We're not even using it. Let's lend it out. All right. Let, let's, let's, well, I'm sorry. Let's use it up, not lend it out. How do you use it up? You use it up. You've now you've got more than the amount of capital required. You've got another million dollars. You could lend out a million dollars, but think about it. You, you, can, you can borrow more and lend more. <laughs> you can make loans, or you can borrow more and take other assets. And you can go beyond a million dollars. So here's what you can, let's consider this. So do you understand the situation that we've done our accounting? We have 170 million in risk weighted assets. We have a requirement, therefore, of 11.9 million uh, in common equity. We have an extra million dollars. Let's consider buying different kinds of assets. How about buying Fannie Mae bonds? All right. Now, what the, what, remember, you only, you only, how much more can you buy? Well, you've got a million dollars. If you're going to buy more, you're going to add both assets and liabilities. You're going to borrow money and you're going to buy more. So you're going to add both assets and liabilities to your balance sheet. How far can you go to bring your, so that you, without violating the capital requirement? Well, what you can 
the amount you can buy of Fannie and Freddie bonds is 1 million all over 0.2 times 0.07, right? Uh, and that's about $70 million worth of Fannie and Freddie bonds. Because you add that to this mix, then it will raise your risk-weighted assets by exactly $1 million. So you can buy $70 million of Fannie and Freddie bonds according to this uh, 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 risk-weighted asset calculation. You see that? But how about making loans to small businesses in our community? Well, that's 100% risk weighting. Uh, so that means I can I could make loans of 1 million all over 0.07, and that's about 14 million. So this is what you would tell it. You're at, at a board meeting and you're saying, let's consider that. We, we're going to stay within the requirements. We can, lend, we can buy 70 million of Fannie bonds, or we, can buy four, or we can make 14 million more loans. Well, at the board meeting, someone might say, you know, 70 million sounds better than 14 million. I think we should do Fannie bonds and tell all the guys with small businesses coming by, um, tough luck, you know, we don't have any money for you. Uh, so you see what it's doing? It's pushing people, the Basel requirement, and these were Basel II or Basel I requirements, were pushing banks toward investing in subprime loans issued by Fannie Mae as against lending to businesses. And people are starting to wonder about that now. Uh, but you have to, you say, well, isn't the prosperity of the country determined by the businesses? Well, why are we lending? Here's what, when you're making a subprime loan, what is a subprime loan? It's a loan to someone with bad credit, who's uh, bad employment history, to buy a house. So uh, we have created an incentive for banks to, to lend to those people rather than to businesses. And so there are critics of Basel, all the Basel agreements saying it's counterproductive. We shouldn't have done this. Putting, you know, th these weights were wrong. There shouldn't have been so little risk weighting on Fannie Mae. But then the Basel people would say, look, we can't get it exactly right. We thought Fannie and Freddie, and we're right, they haven't failed. Our job at Basel is to prevent a run on the banks. So we want banks to be sound. And maybe you're right, maybe businesses should be encouraged, but it's not our department. We're trying to prevent bank failure. So these rules stick, and they're still with us today under Basel III. If you want to subsidize small businesses, countries like in the United States, we have the Small Business Administration that gives loans to small businesses. But um, uh, it's not, uh, Basel III is not going to do that. So, uh, so I said I would talk about other uh, financial crises, and uh, uh, let me talk briefly about a few, and then I'm, I'm going to have to wrap up. Uh, the, um, the crisis that we have been through in, it was a worldwide crisis, starting in 2007, peaking in 2008 and 2009. Uh, and it caused a worldwide recession, so it's especially vivid in our memory. But I want to just reflect that these crises, we've had banking crises so many times in history that uh, it's not a unique event. Uh, and I just wanted to remind ourselves of a, a, f some, a few other crises. Uh, I'm going to start with the Mexican crisis our neighbor to the south, uh, 1994, five. Under President Salinas, um, the uh, government privatized Mexican <coughs> banks. They, they were, Salinas was a Harvard-educated um, economist who wanted to modernize the Mexican economy, and they, they, they privatized the government banks, and turned it over to the free market, and they forgot to regulate it. And so, um, they, it led to a bank lending boom. Uh, in uh, in uh, 1988, uh, lending was 10 percent of GDP. Uh, 1994, up to 40 percent of GDP. Uh, 
Salinas did not stop this. He thought this was, and it led to a boom in Mexico. Because lending was going wild, everything was happening really fast, and it led to a bubble and a boom in Mexico. And there should have been a regulator who said, stop it anyway. But there wasn't effective regulation because Mexico didn't, hadn't, it had deregulated, but it hadn't set up the uh, banking institution, the regulatory institution. So what they developed an atmosphere in Mexico uh, that, you know, I, I, I don't worry about the possible crisis because the Mexican <coughs> government will bail everybody out. And we, you know, <laughs> they couldn't bail everyone out, it turns out. There was a collapse. Uh, so uh, Salinas was replaced by Yale educated uh, Ernesto Zedillo. <laughs> I shouldn't put it that way, but. Uh, uh, and uh, Mexican, the Mexican banking system was destroyed by this crisis. And what ended up happening is that most Mexican banks were taken over by foreign banks. And it was followed by a uh, economy that uh, was heavily damaged by a crisis. Uh, uh, and, uh, but uh, Mexico recovered. and. Uh, uh, it was a, it, 1994, 1995 was unique to that country. It was a, uh, a terrible recession that hit Mexico briefly. That's one example. Uh, but again, it was a regulatory failure that did it. If you allow the moral hazard to develop, if you allow people to think that, hey, let's make all these loans. I think it'll work out, but maybe it won't. And if it doesn't, hey, we have friends in Mexico City, <laughs> and so we'll all be all right. Uh, the next example is the Asian crisis, uh, 1997, uh, and this was uh, it's a very complicated crisis involving a number of Asian countries, but it was heavily related to bank lending, and uh, international banks had lent a lot of money to Asian countries, and. Uh, the countries then had loans that were, uh, they were dependent on loans that were withdrawn when a sort of a bank run occurred. It was something like a bank run because the international investors suddenly wanted to withdraw their money from the Asian countries. Uh, and uh, uh, the Asian crisis started in uh, Thailand and Korea. Uh, and uh, Indonesia, and then it spread all over the world. It reached Russia as a consequence, and it's called the Russian debt crisis. It was a contagion effect, uh, and it got all the way down to Brazil. Uh, you wonder why was Brazil affected by an Asian crisis? Well, the, the world was, uh, it was and is interlinked. Um, so uh, it's, it's experiences like this that encourages the G20 countries now to agree on bank regulation that will prevent this kind of collapse. Uh, and the last example I have is, again, it's not, this one is not so international, the Argentine crisis of 2002. Uh, uh, this was, uh, again, a... Uh, a complicated crisis, but it involved the Argentine government shutting down the banking system in Argentina. Um, and uh, uh, I don't have much time to talk about all this. Um, I guess let me just uh, sum. I, the, the examples that I gave of crises around the world, uh, I went through them very quickly, but I think they. Let me just reiterate the themes that I, I started out with, and that is that the uh, banks fill a fundamental role in our economy. They make things work. <laughs> they solve moral hazard problems. They solve adverse selection problems. Um, they, uh, they create liquidity so that businesses can function and individuals can function. Uh, when uh, when the crisis uh, develops, we, we suddenly realize the importance of 
our banking system in its, a in its absence or in its uh, poor uh, behavior. And so uh, I, I think there's an attitude among a lot of people that they don't like regulators or they don't appreciate regulators. But in fact, regulators are people who are managing a very complicated system which is really important to our prosperity. If you look at causes of economic disruptions, it's failures in our banking system that seem often to be responsible. There's other things, like for example, an oil crisis can bring on a, uh, it seems to be completely independent of a banking crisis. But you take those two together and you explain most uh, economic crises. It's a very important thing to get banks regulated right. Now, what I didn't talk about in this lecture is, and I'm going to come back to this, is the shadow banking system. Let me just mention this in anticipation. Uh, and that refers to other kinds of companies, not officially banks, that are doing business that resembles banking and is not regulated. Uh, so, for example, Lehman Brothers or um, Bear Stearns, which were major failures that led to this crisis, they were not banks. Well, they're not commercial banks. They're not under Basel III. They are investment banks, which is a different animal and it's not regulated by Basel III. Uh, and so, what's happening as uh, we have, let me add, innovation in finance is making the financial world harder and harder to understand. That's why we keep having Basel I, Basel II, Basel III. There's going to be a Basel IV. Financial systems are so much more complicated than they were, say, in the 19th century. There used to be a bank. You can see there's, there's one downtown New Haven that looks like a Greek temple. Uh, you probably didn't even notice it. I, I looked at the cornerstone. It was 19th century. It's a beautiful old building. Banks were like that. They had a nice granite edifice. You'd go in and there'd be a banker sitting there and you could talk to a person <laughs> and they'd make a loan. Uh, but now we have all these complicated derivative contracts and uh, they trade all over the world. It's so interconnected. Uh, that, uh, uh, and shadow banking, which I'll come back to later, shadow banking is a consequence of, it's, it's the kind of thing that happens. Uh, regulators can't keep up with all these innovations. But I don't think the answer is to shut down innovation. We just have to uh, allocate resources and that's a, a trend that we are doing and I think that we will benefit if we have effective and sound regulation that takes into account the subtleties of moral hazard, adverse selection, the importance of liquidity. These are basic important concepts that make for better lives for people. And we have to expect that regulation is going to get complex. Uh, Basel III may look complex. It's going to get even more complex. But we'll have computers managing the <laughs> regulations somewhat. So it'll all be doable. Okay, I'll see you again. I hope you have a nice spring vacation. <laughs>